Hare Krishna. So we begin tonight's session. It's a continuation of the previous week. We want to conclude chapter 16 and 17. And Canto 3. Narayana Namaskrityam Naram Chaiva Narottamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tato Jayam Mudirayet Shunvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hridayanta has to hiba badrani vidu noti surat satam Nashta prayeshu abadreshu Nithyam bhagavata sevaya Bhagavati uttama shloke bhaktir bhavati naistiki. So, from the Bhagavad Gita, one of the most important verses that we all are very familiar with, it reads, it needs no introduction, is the verse. 18.65, where Krishna says, 18.66, sorry, where Krishna says, Sarva Dharman Parityeja Mame Kam Sharanam Raja. Sarva Dharman Parityeja Mame Kam Sharanam Raja. And this is basically a call for surrender. He practically says that you have to surrender unto me. Mame Kam Sharanam Raja. Aham Tvam Sarva Pape Bio Mokshya Asmi Masuchaha. So he knows that the call for surrender has to accompany a certain reassurance because surrender is a certain vulnerability. It's not easy to surrender. It's very, very difficult to surrender even if one has no fear. There would still be a certain position of vulnerability that is faced with the position of surrender. So as a consequence, he's reassuring Arjuna, reassuring everyone saying, Ma suchaha, do not be afraid. Ma suchaha. Sarva Dharman Parityaja Mame Kam Sharam Raja. The point we want to make here is that this whole concept of service, which is Bhakti, Abhideya, requires love and it requires surrender. Surrender is the quality of making ourselves available and making ourselves available to the master, making ourselves available in such a manner where we don't have personal freedom. We are practically available 24-7 to be at the beck and call of the one who is being served. This is very favorably experienced by many devotees who have served Srila Prabhupada personally. Uh, my own spiritual master, His Holiness Bhakti Tita Maharaj, he used to explain the fact that those who serve Srila Prabhupada they will have to maintain their schedule in alignment with Srila Prabhupada's schedule, which essentially means that they got to rest while he's resting. They have to be awake while he's awake. And sometimes they would basically will not have the time for them to even catch up with their rounds and they would not be able to even chant the japa. They wouldn't be able to do what their basic activities are simply because they're trying to align that time with Srila Prabhupada. Stalwart devotees who are extremely focused even they can't last with that kind of a schedule. There are many young people who can't cope with that kind of a schedule. And this is an experience with some of my God brothers they've had with my spiritual master while they were traveling with him. They can't cope with the schedule of the guru. In a similar fashion, Prabhupada's disciples could not cope with the pressure of being his servant. And it was almost as if when they're just about to take some rest, the bell would ring. He would have a little bell and he would just ring the bell just as just when their head is hitting the pillow. So to some level, it could practically mean that they don't have a life of their own. They're practically an extension of the activities of the spiritual master. Now, this is basically an experience of surrender where you don't have free will. You have practically submitted your entire amount of time to the service of the spiritual master. And by doing so, you're serving Krishna. So this is also experienced in temples where there aren't many pujaris. Um, Mother Hladini, who was a Prabhupada disciple, um, a very exalted personality, exalted, very inspiring. And she was a very, very, um, I would say, a focused servant of the deities in New Vrindavan for several years when they had no infrastructure, they had no facility for proper service and she used to be the only pujari. And whilst being the only pujari, which means that you have to wake up at two o'clock 
you have to make the first offering and then you'll have to be there to open the curtain before that you have to basically serve the deities you have to be ready with whatever they are honoring at the opening of the curtains you know before the opening of the curtains and then you have to do the arati and then you have to again prepare for the next arati and then you're again preparing for lunch and then you're again preparing for the evening and as a consequence from two o'clock in the morning right up to shainati which is at 10 o'clock if there is only one pujari in a temple which is dedicated they would not have time and she used to face that phenomenon and she used to face that phenomenon but she took advantage she took advantage of allowing that phenomenon to pierce material nature because this requires surrender you cannot serve the lordships you cannot serve the spiritual master without surrender it essentially means that unless we step aside we can't really function and we can't really serve and surrender we need to step aside so that there's a certain sense of empowerment which is given and that empowerment would allow us to basically serve the deities would allow us to serve the spiritual master so the process of for example initiation second initiation brahmanical initiation very specifically in iskon in the gaudiya sams uh, mat in general the gaudiya parampara brahma mat the ava parampara we basically are empowering devotees to develop a certain sense of brahmanical culture with which they would be able to approach the deities which essentially means that there is also a great diminishment of false ego if the gayatris are done properly there is a qualitative change that occurs in the person qualitative in terms of becoming brahmanical in other words we are not brahmanas but then because we are in touch with the material world very profoundly in so many different activities we can't qualify ourselves as brahmanas if you really were to examine the rules and regulations of traditional um what we would call as brahmanas and brahmacharis in the vedic sense we would not qualify we would just not qualify they had all kinds of rules and regulations and there was complete dedication if you were to for example examine the uh the different matas which basically are the different spiritual orders the vaishnav there are four different vaishnav sampradayas and the four different vaishnav sampradayas they are extraordinarily strict in how they could function in the role of you know guru and so on and so forth you know in, in other words you you can't really expect them to go into pujari service unless they have had like 10 15 years of training you know they practically have to go and to a, what we would call a veda patashala you know this time when i was in south india i had the good fortune of seeing uh, students who were a part of what we would call vedic learning at a very young age in in a temple environment in south southern india where they were being encouraged and they are all being taught the vedas so you'll have to practice and learn all the vedas you have to learn the vedanta you have to have all kinds of what we would call a specialization this is almost a 12 year project so they enroll at a very young age they graduate then they either become priests or they continue serving in the particular order and then they continue further so what is astonishing in our movement is the fact that we basically have the capacity to understand very intricate deep truths without having the background or the education to understand such it's a fact of life we have the ability to understand things which we can't even comprehend how we could possibly understand this is basically mercy it's not possible it's not possible you know it is really not possible because we are very profoundly in touch with material nature because we are working in the western world or even in india for that matter and when we are in touch with material nature so profoundly our limbs are in touch with material nature we receive compensation from those who are very steeped in material culture and this doesn't allow what we would call an encouragement of the um, the development of bhakti because our limbs and our psychology and we are also being maintained by a certain culture which is very steeped in material consciousness while we have this kind of a background what is astonishing is the accomplishment of so many devotees in a very short span of time uh, you know i had the opportunity to be with one one particular devotee back in new jersey in america and his father was a very traditional mridanga player he was very traditional in other words in the southern part of india his father was a mridanga player in the classical sense and he taught this devotee 
classical mudanga, which required extraordinary tuition for almost 10 years. And it required all kinds of effort for him to basically learn this. A lot, lot of chastisement, discipline, and he had to pick this up. And then he was quite astonished when he came to ISKCON because he used to find these young children who are five and seven and 10 come in as devotees, new devotees into a temple. And then they would start playing very good mridanga within three months. And he used to be astonished because they would actually fit into the role of playing mridanga within three months. And they would just come in and then they would pick up in three months, they would be a part of a kirtan party. And then they would learn and learn and learn. And then they would just become very good in either mridanga, harmonium, singing, you know, kirtan. So it's quite astonishing that what takes an enormous effort externally is being given to us in a very easy way. So we don't even comprehend what we are being given. We have no idea because we don't know otherwise. We do not know what it takes, to be honest. We really do not know because we don't have exposure to more traditional forms of learning. We don't have exposure to what we call in you know, the different very strict or you know, monastic orders who practically manage these sampradayas and the way they pass on Vedic education. We, have, we don't know what they do. So we have no comprehension of the extraordinarily, um, you know, what I would call as um, arduous energy, you know, what I would call effort that is required from their, from their side for them to serve and be a part of that particular monastic order. In our situation, there's so much mercy flowing from Lord Nityananda that we come in and we don't even comprehend that we are actually picking up extraordinarily sublime truths without much effort. And this effortlessness, effortlessness actually makes us quite arrogant at times, where we think that we have comprehended the entire Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita. In reality, what we don't realize is that the gates are being opened by Lord Nityananda's mercy. And as a consequence, we are able to see very sublime, very intricate truths within Shastra, which others can't really see. You can't really come in and then pick up Shastra and then actually speak and then be able to give faith to others. Because the process of giving faith to others was required an extraordinary amount of commitment and training, which is what was noticed in Vedic India. They used to dedicate themselves to learning. They used to dedicate themselves to a certain kind of livelihood. There used to be austerity where they would not touch food if unless it was basically cooked by someone whom they knew because they were so particularly conscious of the chitta, the consciousness of those who are cooking, you know, food, they would, they would not touch. I have seen those circumstances. Um, I, I grew up in a family where I've seen my own grandmother. Um, she never used to allow, or rather, she never used to partake dinner and lunch, and she never used to eat with us. She used to cook on her own till the age of 70 to 72, until she was completely incapacitated. That's because my mother and others were cooking, they were not initiated. So she would not even accept food in the house that was cooked by others who were not initiated. But that was the kind of strictness in terms of what they could eat and what they wouldn't eat. And they used to spend time with great effort throughout the day, learning things and reading Shastra. So the point I'm trying to make here and trying to convey here is that we just don't know and we don't realize how easy this has been made for us by Srila Prabhupada. We have no idea as to how much mercy has been given that we're able to jump across and learn extraordinarily sublime, very deep truths in such an easy way. Yeah, It's very, very difficult for us to even comprehend. Now, the point I was wanting to make about Sarva Dharman Parityajya Mamekam Sharnam Raja is the, is the fact that surrender requires complete dedication. And you need to be forced into certain circumstances. So that's why it's called Vidhi. The spiritual master is practically inflicting discipline upon the disciple. And by inflicting discipline upon the disciple, they're actually making them perfect because they're bringing them in touch with Krishna through their own frame. The, the super soul who is within the heart is practically observing us and observing our consciousness and then when the time comes, the super soul brings us in touch with a personality who carries Krishna's swarup in their heart. In other words, they are able to practically convey Krishna's spiritual potency to us through the process of, you know, speaking through the process of, um, you know, being an exemplar in certain ways. 
And when we come in touch with the Swarup Shakti of Krishna through personalities, then we are able to receive faith. So this is basically a process where our super soul practically arranges for us to be inspired, which is the super soul himself is practically inspiring us by choosing someone and then bringing us in touch with his own Swarup, his own original potency, the spiritual potency. And then it is being passed on to us. And then we are able to cultivate our faith. Now, what is not understood in this process is that this requires discipline and this requires being disciplined to and being imposed upon. And being imposed upon requires a certain procedure. This is called vidhi. This is basically vidhi or procedure that is required for us to purify ourselves over a period of time so that then we can, we can basically position ourselves to accept the relationship. Bhakti doesn't begin until you reach the position of bhava. Bhakti doesn't begin. Before that, it's mixed with so many different flavors. So bhava is basically where you really are in love because without love, one can't surrender. So there are times when people used to say that they did things for Srila Prabhupada which are unimaginable. They would never do it even for a big salary, but they did it because there was so much love which was given by Srila Prabhupada and this reciprocation by the devotees to Srila Prabhupada practically was so profound that they did things which they probably wouldn't do, wouldn't do even for a salary. They took risks with their lives. They practically gave up 20 years of their life, more than that in many cases. Very young devotees, you know, if you meet Srila Prabhupada's disciples, then you would find that some of them joined at the age of 18. They did not go through college. They did not go through getting themselves a degree. They, did, they were not educated from the perspective of being materially educated. And then by the time they came out of the ashram from saffron and they started wearing white, it was 20 years. And then all in a sudden, they basically wanted to basically make a living, which means you need an education, you need some training. So in many ways, the early devotees were imposed upon and they were given procedures and they were basically purified by Srila Prabhupada by coming in touch with him and by in inflicting a certain kind of discipline. Now, why am I even bringing this up when I speak of surrender? Is that surrender is being imposed upon us because if you don't impose surrender, then we will not have the ability to clear the clutter from our desk. Sometimes someone very unfortunately gets afflicted by a serious disease. And when they get afflicted by a serious disease, which is terminal by nature, at least by, in the eyes of the doctors, they tell them that it's terminal and you only have a certain period of time. Then they start basically wanting to clear the clutter. So they have never ever focused on spirituality, but now they have cleared the clutter from their desk because they now have a limited finite amount of time. And then they start moving towards focused activity because you just have a set of things that you could do if you have limited time. Now, circumstances that overwhelm us in devotional service, which means when life becomes overwhelming, it is simply a sign that Krishna wants us to focus because he's going to impose devotional service. He's practically going to impose circumstances which we cannot solve. Sarva dharman mame kam You cannot solve it. You can't solve circumstances and that would require submitting ourselves and accepting the environment. When we accept the environment fully, and then we start acting upon it with the direction of those who are spiritually senior and advanced, then what we do have an opportunity to do is that we have the ability to make some advancement because material nature is very thick. You need to be imposed upon and you need to have a certain experience that is quite intense for you to be able to pierce material nature. And piercing material nature, without piercing material nature, you can't really scale in the peak that we have to scale in terms of devotional service. You are climbing a peak. And if you don't increase the intensity, if you do not increase the intensity while you're scaling a peak, then what does happen is that you're not going to be able to make it to the top. You're going to stop at a plateau. You're going to reflect and you're going to stop. You're not going to move forward. So the whole process of Sarva Dharman Parityajya Mamikam Sharanam Vaja requires the ingredient of unresolvable circumstances that are being imposed upon, which would practically part the way for us so that we could limo clutter and we're able to focus on the most serious aspects of life. Yeah, it does require. So we shouldn't underestimate the circumstances if you come in touch 
with Krishna consciousness. There's always the Krishna factor. There is always the Krishna factor. Even if you are dealing with devotees in the temple, we should never forget, even if we are being imposed upon and if there is a particular circumstance that's not favorable, do not ever think that this circumstance has been come to us and it's just this, this person who is practically causing this issue. There's always the Krishna factor. And this Krishna factor has to be understood. And the first step in understanding the Krishna factor is to accept the circumstances that we are in, saying that this could not have come upon me without you wanting this. Now, it doesn't mean Krishna wants to make us suffer. He has no intention of wanting to make us suffer. In reality, he is very eager to bring us closer and he loves us. We just can't recognize that because we have arranged our life in such a complex way that we come in touch with complexity in life. And we start thinking that this is Krishna and I come and I chant I'm doing my 16 rounds. I come and do my service. I'm waking up. I'm doing all kinds of things, Krishna. Now then you are doing this to me. Sometimes we become confrontational with him. You know, how, how could you do this to me? I'm doing all of this for you. I'm chanting my 16 rounds. I'm doing my seva. I've dedicated my life to you. And then this is you reciprocating. In reality, it's not him who is reciprocating. This is our karma. However, what is the best way to accept that particular circumstance that is almost insurmountable, where it's being imposed upon us, where we do not know what we have to do? The first step is to accept it. That is surrender. Accept it, saying, okay, this is your arrangement because I know your intentions. Regardless of what arrangements you're going to make, you want me to come closer to you. This is your intention. So this intention has to be known to us as practicing devotees. We want to know that he is trying to bring us closer. This is a fact. This is exactly what is being arranged. So he keeps sending scores and scores of his servants who are personal servants. They carry the Swarup Shakti of Krishna. They are practically representatives of the spiritual potency. Only if there is a representative of the spiritual potency would they be able to give faith. So they come and they distribute faith because these are personal associates and they're able to carry the faith because they have a relationship with Krishna. The Sambandha with Krishna is very deeply within them. And as a consequence, they practically want to distribute the sambandha through the sound vibration. By just their presence, they can just distribute sambandha. Because of the fact that the sambandha in their hearts is very, very thick. It's, it's practically, it's very, I would say, profoundly um, um, you know, uh, manifesting in the hearts of the devotees. As a consequence, they're able to distribute this sambandha, this relationship through their connection. So Krishna keeps sending people to us and trying to pick us up. But then there are circumstances in life which are insurmountable, that every one of us potentially can face. This is not something which, what, what we want to wish for, we don't want complexity, no one wants to suffer, no one wants difficulties, but it's a fact of life that we do carry a burden. And sometimes that burden can become insurmountable. The insurmountable burden is when we came to throw up our hands and say, this is you. Krishna, this is you, because I know you love me, and I know you want me to come closer to you. And you're just giving me this opportunity by basically allowing me to accept the arrangement. So I'm going to accept the arrangement. Remove all the nonsense from my life. Yeah, remove all the nonsense from my life because there's so much clutter. I've just cluttered my life. If there's so much confusion, just remove all of this so that I can be yours. I can be yours. So this is you. You, know, you are arranging this. The day we start accepting the arrangement, intelligence would flow through. He would teach us from within the heart how to navigate the circumstances. Good decisions would come by because there's sincerity in the heart and we want to basically move forward and embrace the Lord. We want to come closer to him. Because of the sincerity, there would be a reciprocation of intelligence that's been given to us. So there would be this particular manifestation. Sometimes it's even more profound. You can actually come in touch with people. You can come in touch with people whom he's arranging and he's pulling us through and he's bringing us closer. And then he's practically demonstrating that, you know, this is basically me. I'm there for you. You know, I'm not going to let go. So we find that when you read the lives of great personalities, the Goswamis, Sri Sanatan Goswami, Sri Sanatan Goswami was incarcerated by the Islamic ruler. What was the problem with him? He was practically incarcerated. He was incarcerated. He was thrown into a prison, more like a dungeon, and because of which he developed skin disorders because he was in touch with you know, uh, very bad conditions in the prison because of which he started developing all kinds of skin issues and so on and so forth. 
because he was put into circumstances. This is the Goswamis. They come out of it and then Krishna basically uh, you know, cures them. But then the attitude which they display, because they were already in touch with Srimad Bhagavatam. The Goswamis were already in touch with Srimad Bhagavatam before being imposed upon in this manner. Yeah. And they basically come close to a circumstance which is extraordinarily problematic. They accept it as Krishna's arrangement and then they're able to basically receive some intelligence. Um, I remember this story um, shared by my spiritual master, His Holiness Bhakti Tita Maharaj. Um, there was a time when he was, you know, most of you who know him, he, he is of African-American descent. Um, and Srila Prabhupada used to be extraordinarily, extraordinarily um, impressed and very happy for the kind of risks he was taking. Uh, it was said that because he was very dark and when he was walking in the streets of Eastern Europe, because that was basically the place which Srila Prabhupada gave him, when he was walking in the streets of Eastern Europe, uh, you know, it was complete rarity for people to see a black person. So there used to be traffic accidents at traffic stops. Children used to throw stones at him, literally, because that's how they used to treat him, simply because they had not seen such a person. It was, but you can just imagine the circumstance. And then Eastern Europe those days was under the Soviet uh, domination. As a consequence, uh, for every person who was especially American, uh, you always had the KGB, you always had the spy networks and the secret police and so on following you because they were always suspicious of Americans coming into Eastern Europe. So literally they used to be chased and there used to be times when they used to chase them in the trains and he used to lock himself up in the toilet in Eastern Europe while he was traveling in the train toilet for 12 to 15 hours. People used to assume that it was broken. They used to bang on it and then they used to just walk away so that he would not be spotted because he used to stand out. And he used to just chant in the toilet, even though it was abominable, he used to just chant in the toilet. He used to have his beat bag, he used to chant. Yeah. And then there were the circumstances when when he was distributing in Eastern Europe, he went into a certain university. And when he was in a university, he went from one door to another and he found you know, that the, the police were behind him. So he just stepped into an academic office and then he started distributing the Bhagavatam. Yeah. So this was how Srila Prabhupada's servants distributed Srimad Bhagavatam, putting themselves at great risk. There was one time in Romania Whilst he was returning, I think he was he was a, he was not a good driver. <laughs> Admittedly, he was he was poor in driving because he used to be overworked. He used to sleep very little. He never used to eat much, and as a consequence, um, you know, towards the end of the evening, uh, he could be quite erratic in his behavior because of the, the the driving, not behavior. Sorry, the driving used to be a little bit. He used to fall asleep on the wheel. Um, so. One time in Romania, uh, he actually hit someone. The person wasn't um, hurt. It was, just, it was an accident. And they practically, he, they'd searched for him. They tried to search who it was. They couldn't find anybody. And then whilst that particular situation happened, um, I think it was, it, it, we don't know if it was an animal or a person, but then what happened was uh, he hurt his finger because the windshield broke. And then there was blood coming out of his finger. And then he went to the border and then he, they asked for the license and the papers and they saw blood smeared. Oh, the security people, they, they saw blood smeared in the passport and the papers. They immediately put him in prison. And this was when Srila Prabhupada was preparing to depart from the world. This was 1977. So all the authorities, they were in India and Vrindavan. So there was no one he could contact. There was no one whom he could basically petition to bring. He was thrown into prison in Romania. And they found that he was American. And they also found that he was basically representing an international organization. So they thought that they could collect money because those days it used to be that way. And they used to collect, they could collect money. They could have some kind of a bargain that could go on between the prison authorities and everybody else. And so he was actually stuck in prison and he almost gave up. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm, you know, he, he tried all kinds of things. He was extraordinarily agitated as anybody else would be. He was quite young, you know, he was very young. And then he was agitated because he was going to be thrown into a prison 
in Eastern Europe and nobody knows where he is because the, all the authorities are in India, then he started basically accepting it. That's what he did. He practically accepted the circumstance and he said, okay, this is Krishna because I was serving you, this happened. So you can't be not involved in it. You are involved in it because I was serving you and this happened. So he started just dedicating himself and internally he practically developed the sense of saying, this is life. I'm just going to stay in prison. I'm going to chant. I'm going to do some yoga asanas and so on so that I could be fit. And, you know, Krishna, this is basically what you have basically arranged for me. So he began accepting it. He started accepting it. When he began accepting it, there was some intelligence that came into his heart. And the intelligence itself was that you should communicate to your authorities by letter, regardless of whether they're receiving it. And you should basically um, write to them saying that you're going to basically stay in prison. You're not going to leave. You don't mind. So he started writing, even though he knew that there was no one to write to. He started sending out letters and he knew that every letter was read by the prison authorities in Romania. You know, and, and those places, you really don't have any rules. They just if you're caught and then if they can do anything to you and if you're American, then it's, it's even worse. You know, they can just basically keep you there and they could blame you for something and then you could be a part of their life for 30, 40 years. It was just something which you couldn't come out of. So he started writing letters saying, I'm okay with this. He knew no one is going to read, but he knew the prison authorities would read. Krishna gave him this intelligence. He started saying, I'm okay with it. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to practice some yoga. I'm going to chant. If possible, I will just share a little bit of truth about you, uh, you know, about our movement to the fellow prisoners and so on and so forth. So the letters were read. And these people, they read the letter and they practically decided to let him go because they did not want a liability. So the whole plan of wanting to keep him for money fell apart because he was American and Americans generally have a tendency to go and ask for their people. They don't give up. The, the, the other governments, they don't really go after their citizens if the citizens are stuck. The American government, they would go. They would go, they would be aggressive about it. They would demand that the citizen be released. So they are very clear that their citizens can't be subjected to so on and so forth. So they can't hold back the citizen if he's missing. People knew that he was in Eastern Europe. But he started writing letters. And then what happened was it was almost miraculous that they just let him go after almost several weeks, almost a month. They started, they let him go because they didn't want to keep him. He was a liability and he wanted to stay. And they recognized that he wanted to stay. They just let him go. It almost seems incredulous that they would just let him go. But that's what happened. But if you can just imagine the circumstances when you're 25, he was in his 20s. He was in his 20s. He is, you know, he's, uh, he's an American. He's, uh, he's an African-American. He's not even white American, where you can just kind of adjust in Europe. He's an African-American. And there you are behind prison for distributing literature, which is forbidden, and for representing an organization. And they used to wear wigs and so on and so forth those days to distribute, which means that you're disguising yourself and you're not who you are. All kinds of complications could have descended. But then Krishna practically allowed him to experience a position of surrender. You can't even imagine what this is. We can't even imagine. I cannot, I cannot even conceive of how someone could remain calm in those circumstances. You know, people would have lost it. They would have given up on Krishna consciousness. But he came out much stronger. And he came out much stronger because of this experience where he practically then they gave him his van, they gave him his passport. He traveled back to the border and then he entered West Germany. He just collapsed in West Germany. The, the collapsing was just relief because, he, you know, you no idea what that could have felt like. But what I was just wanting to say is, even those who have dedicated themselves and they have, in one sense, they are not really engaging in karma. They're engaging in pure devotional service because that's what they're doing. 24-7, you're just distributing books and you're a part of a temple. You know, you're not in touch with um, material nature. Even those personalities, they go through circumstances of intense surrender. All kinds of devotees, if you're sincere in the heart and you want to come close, we go through circumstances of surrender, of circumstances that are almost impossible for us to resolve. And because we are almost impossible for us to resolve, we have no other way but to remove all the clutter, improve our practice, and then 
make a, a very good attempt at surrendering to Krishna and then submitting ourselves saying, okay, this arrangement is beyond me. Please guide me. Please help me so that I could focus on, you know, the process of bhakti. Now, the reason for my bringing up Sarvadharma and Parityaja in the context of the circumstance that we're going to discuss is that oftentimes in Srimad Bhagavatam, the demigods who are extraordinarily efficient servants of Krishna, they come into circumstances which they cannot resolve. Hiranya Kashipu, Hiranyaksha, they cannot resolve. Nobody could resolve. The greatest of demigods, they actually became crestfallen with fear as they approached Lord Brahma. They became extraordinarily fearful because that was the amount of inauspicious vibes and circumstances that were coming out by the birth of Hiranyaksha and Hiranya Kashipu. Now, these personalities themselves were so powerful that the demigods were also devotees of the Lord and the residents of the planet. Everybody had no other resolve but to surrender. You have to surrender. You can't solve the problem. It is just beyond you. This is particularly a hallmark of being able to appreciate the opportunity for complete surrender. So the devotees have the opportunity for complete surrender. So this is basically the opportunity of paritranaya sadhunam, vinashaya chidushkutam. Vinashaya chidushkutam, in general, Krishna's energies, Krishna's external energies, she is capable of destroying anyone. There is no need for Krishna to come. This is an arrangement that he can just make where everything can just be destroyed. It's extraordinarily powerful. So it is not something which he needs to descend. But then this paritranaya sadhunam requires his presence because now you have this very personal circumstance of someone who is in deep trouble, who is also in love with him, and he is in love with this person. Now this entire circumstance becomes insurmountable for the devotee, and the insurmountable devotee practically removes clutter if they're intelligent. If they are intelligent, they would remove clutter. This is not useful. This is not useful in this circumstance. There's only one thing that I can do. I can chant. I can improve upon my Krishna consciousness. I can just focus more and more. And that's the solution. In reality, there really isn't any other solution to life. If you want to solve problems, you need a spiritual solution. And you need a spiritual solution that can actually give you forward movement for the Atma. For us, we are so fortunate to come to Krishna consciousness that this is an extraordinary rarity. Because of the billions and billions and billions of jivas, unimaginable number of jivas, a very small portion, minuscule portion of the, of the millions would want to liberate themselves. This is from Srimad Bhagavatam, right? Tens of millions of jivas, one would want to liberate themselves. The rest want to just kind of make adjustments on the planet, which we all are aware of. Out of these millions and millions, a few want to liberate themselves. And of the few, maybe one is able to liberate themselves. And then beyond that particular rarity lies the idea of coming in touch with the relationship with the Supreme Lord. Now, that is a very specific rarity because the coming in touch with the relationship with Krishna requires us coming in touch with someone who carries the Swarup Shakti of Krishna. They are carrying and representing the internal potency of Krishna, the Yogamaya potency. Where there's yoga, there's a connection between the devotee and Krishna, which is being you know, engineered by this empowered personality who is able to kind of engineer the connection, right? Now, this is very rare because it's an extraordinary rarity. It's an extraordinary rarity. Now, when you have such a rarity and you have circumstances in life that you can't handle, it's a wonderful combination. It's a wonderful combination. It's a wonderful combination. All you need to do is just keep accepting life on a day-to-day -day basis. It will all calm down. It will all calm down. But you need to start accepting first. You need to start accepting. You need to start accepting that no one can save me except Krishna. Then you become dependent on him. This is like a small child crossing the road. If the child is going to dot between different people and hold on to their hands, the crossing of the road is going to be extraordinarily dangerous. On the other hand, if the child is able to hold on to just one finger, which is Krishna's finger, and we're crossing the road, in reality, if the child is able to hold on to a parent, just one parent, you know, not moving here and there, then it becomes easy. So we need to understand that life circumstances, once you are in Krishna consciousness, should never be disconnected from Krishna. Never ever evaluate life as of today 
in a position where Krishna is not present. No matter what we go through, no matter as as horrible or as impossible the circumstances, you know, never ever evaluate life once you're in Krishna consciousness minus Krishna, because that is not true. He is very intimately involved. That could be through different circumstances. We need to accept it. So this whole concept of Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu and the multiple demons who have dominated the planet, they have also caused great, great troubles to the demigods. So you can't take shelter of the demigods. You cannot take shelter of the demigods. That's being proven by Srimad Bhagavatam. You cannot take shelter of the demigods because the demigods themselves are crestfallen. They are practically fearful of the circumstance because this Hiranyaksha, Hiranyakashipu, they usurped Indra's kingdom. Bali Maharaj overtook Indra and then became the king of heavens before Sri Vamanadev came and brought him down you know, with love because Bali Maharaj was such a, he's a Mahajan. His behavior is counted to be one of the great uh, you know, personalities. So what we are trying to understand here from this particular lesson of Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu is a lesson that we need to keep in mind for ourselves. And the lesson itself is that if you have circumstances of life and everyday circumstances, please learn to wake up in the morning, look into the mirror and say that today is an arrangement made by you. When you go out with that consciousness, then you will be able to transform each and every circumstance as if it's been arranged by him. It may not be, it may just be our karma, but if you already have that mindset that everything is being arranged by him, then we will have the opportunity for us to be able to transform then and there, we'll be able to transcend circumstances on each and every day. That day would be special. That day would be special because you're going to come across different people and you're going to accept that this is the arrangement of Krishna. Then you're going to be an instrument. Maybe you are going to be used in certain ways. Maybe you're going to be given a certain kind of blessing. So this is how we wake up. We wake up understanding that whatever is going to happen today is being arranged by him. So this is basically the mindset that we, we need to operate in. Never ever remove Krishna from the circumstance of your life. And always understand that even though it's your karma, it's being arranged by him. You know, if you kind of have that understanding, then it would be very easy for us to be able to accept him into our hearts and to receive instructions so the intelligence comes in and we are able to move forward. Now, this is basically what we read here. And I'm just going to continue and then we'll continue all the way to the 17th chapter and the end of 17th chapter. So I'm going to read a few verses to conclude our discussion. But I was wanting to say that um, always view circumstances of impossibility in life and compare it to the circumstances of Hiranyaksha, Hiranyakashipu, where the great demigods, the, the denizens of heavens and everybody, nobody could resolve the issue. This is an opportunity for everybody to surrender. That's why this whole Lord Narasimha's avatar, yeah. If you read the Anushtup mantra, which is the Ugram Viram Mahavishnu Jalantam Sarvatomukam, the very familiar um, Anushtup mantra of Lord Narasimha, the 32 syllables, it is Anushtup essentially means it is 32. Yeah, Gayatri is 24, 32 is Anushtup. Now, basically, the Anushtup mantra of Lord Narasimha. Each and every syllable of that particular mantra is associated with a demigod. Yeah. So there are different personalities, Ugram, Vira, Mahavishnu. So each and every syllable of that mantra is associated with the power of a demigod, which essentially means that he is the origin of all the demigods. He is the origin of all the potencies that we are seeing manifest here. So the idea that I'm trying to convey here is that these are extraordinarily auspicious, um, what I would call as, um, uh, uh, you know, leelas of the Lord, even though the circumstances were very difficult for the devotees because he is practically giving them an opportunity to surrender because you can't really part material nature. We can't really pierce material nature unless there's intensity. And intensity requires surrender. Intensity requires circumstances that we can't handle. You know, we are not going to call out for help from our heart if circumstances in life don't necessitate such a calling. So that's why devotees have to be fearless because we're going to be arranged. Everything is going to be arranged in a wonderful way so that Krishna will bring us closer to him. He would just hug us. This is an embrace. 
Yeah, this is an embrace. So devotees have to be fearless because whatever would be the circumstances, he is going to bring us closer. He is going to bring us closer. I'm going to just accept each and every day as his arrangement. I'm going to look at everybody whom I meet and say that this is his arrangement. Some experiences could be wonderful. Some experiences may not be, but then this is his arrangement. I will pick up a few things from that. And then I would offer it to Krishna in service because he's wanting me to learn from these circumstances. So that should be the mindset. So let's just read through the verses. So I'm on text 15, chapter 16, canto 3. You can just follow along with me if you have a copy of Srimad Bhagavatam. I will stop when I need to. The four Brahmana sages were nevertheless extremely delighted to behold him, and they experienced a thrill throughout their bodies. Then they spoke as follows to the Lord, who had revealed the multi-glories of the Supreme Personality through his internal potency, Yoga Maya. The sages said, O Supreme Personality of God, we are unable to know what you intend for us to do, for even though you are the supreme ruler of all, you speak in our favor as if we had done something good for you. He is speaking in plain language, the previous 15 verses. The great Kumaras who are extraordinarily empowered, they are incarnations yeah, in one sense. Yeah, they're extraordinarily empowered, but they could basically not comprehend what Krishna was wanting to do. It was bewildering because his presence was so extraordinary that they just didn't know what to do. O oh Lord, you are the supreme director of the Brahmanical culture. You are considering the Brahmanas to be in the highest position is your example for teaching others. Actually, you are the supreme worshipable deity, not only for the gods, but for the Brahmanas as well. Also, you are the source of the eternal occupation of all living entities. And by your multi-manifestations of the personalities of Godhead, you always protected religion. You are the supreme objective of religious principles. And in our opinion, you are inexhaustible and unchangeable eternally. Mystics and transcendentalists, by the mercy of the Lord, cross beyond nations by seizing all material desires. It's not possible, therefore, that the Supreme Lord can be favored by others. The goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, the dust of whose feet is worn on the head by others, waits upon you as appointed, for she is anxious to secure a place in the abode of the king of bees who hovers on the fresh wreath of tulsi leaves offered at your feet by some blessed devotee. O Lord, you are exceedingly attached to the activities of your pure devotees, yet you are never attached to the goddess of fortune who constantly, engage, who constantly engages in your transcendental loving service. How can you be purified, therefore, by the dust of the path traversed by the Brahmanas? And how can you be glorified or made fortunate by the mark of the Srivatsa on your chest? So this is Krishna in the previous verses where he is saying that he is purified by the dust of the feet of the Vaishnavas. He says his feet are glorious. Yeah. His feet are sought after and his service is being sought after because he practically takes on the association and the dust of the lotus feet of the Vaishnavas. So this is Krishna himself glorifying sadhus. O oh Lord, you are the personification of all religion. Therefore, you manifest yourself in three millenniums and you protect this universe, which consists of animate and inanimate beings. By your grace, which is of pure goodness and is the bestower of all blessings, kindly drive away the elements of Rajas and Tamas for the sake of the demigods and twice born. O oh Lord, you are the protector of the highest of the twice born. If you do not protect them by offering worship and mild words, then certainly the auspicious path of worship will be rejected by people in general who act on the strength and authority of your lordship. Dear Lord, you never want the auspicious path to be destroyed, for you are the reservoir of all goodness. Just to benefit people in general, you destroy the evil element by your mighty potency. You are the proprietor of the three creations and the maintainer of the entire universe. Therefore, your potency is not reduced by your submissive behavior. Rather, by submission, you exhibit your transcendental pastimes. So this is wonderful, where they are practically seeing that such a great personality is submitting themselves. He is actually submitting himself. He's practically saying that, you know, he's practically petitioning the Kumaras to bless the, uh, the doorkeepers, Jaya and Vijaya. He's practically so concerned 
about the Kumaras, that he's, sorry, about the doorkeepers, Jaya and Vijaya, that he's petitioning them. He's saying, please forgive them. And here, he is such a great personality. I mean, he, he could have just, he could have removed the influence of the curse. He could have just removed the influence of the curse. But he is showing and demonstrating behavior of wanting the Kumaras to practically forgive Jaya and Vijaya. So he was wanting to show sub, you know, submissive behavior. Oh Lord, whatever punishment you wish to award to these two innocent persons and also to us, we shall accept without duplicity. We understand that we have cursed two faultless persons. The Kumaras were overwhelmed with anger, which was not unusual, which was, which was quite unusual, sorry. Jaya and Vijaya were overwhelmed by the particular circumstance of finding fault with the Kumaras, preventing them from entering. And all of these circumstances were practically managed by Kala, the supreme time factor. Because you are a part of material energy, you are basically going to be influenced by the supreme time factor. We read in the previous session that because this incident happens right at the gate of Vaikuntha, it is Tatastha. So there's a possibility of being influenced by material nature. Now, after being influenced by such, they are practically not sure as to why they cursed. They are not sure as to why they became angry. And this is basically a circumstance which we saw in the previous session that there were two children who were conceived or who are basically supposed to be conceived by Diti and Kashyapa Muni. And those two children were of a demoniac propensity that particular incident, which was inauspicious, had to be matched by inauspicious circumstances. And these two inauspicious circumstances were equated and all kinds of incidents take place. So it's just fascinating to see how connected the universe is. The Lord replied, O Brahmanas, know that the punishment you inflicted on them was originally ordained by me. And therefore they will fall to a birth in a demoniac family, but they will be firmly united with me in thought through mental concentration intensified by anger and they will return to my presence shortly. Lord Brahma said, sorry. Lord Brahma said, after seeing the Lord of Vaikuntha, the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the self-illuminated Vaikuntha planet, the sages left the transcendental abode. The sages circumambulated the Supreme Lord, offered their obeisances in return extremely delighted at learning at learning of the divine opulence of the Vaishnava. The Lord then said to his attendants, Jaya and Vijaya, depart this place, but fear not. All glory is unto you. Though I am capable of nullifying the Brahmana's curse, I would not do so. On the contrary, it has my approval. You see, this is basically a circumstance. Jaya and Vijaya accepting the circumstance and then Krishna is giving them intelligence, saying, it is ordained by me, and I could have nullified it, but I'm allowing you to experience it because there's some purpose. This is basically what we go through without the extra, you know, what I would call as the knowledge that Krishna basically is giving us intelligence. We go through these circumstances as well. In other words, we also go through circumstances where it's insurmountable. And all we need to do is accept it as Krishna's arrangement. Then Krishna gives us intelligence saying, this is how you're going to navigate out of this. So something or the other, some help would be provided. Yeah, some help would be provided. So this is basically Jaya and Vijaya accepting the arrangement. Then Krishna revealing to them that this is my plan. Don't worry. This departure from Vaikuntha was foretold by Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. She was very angry because when she left my abode and she returned, you stopped her at the gate when I was sleeping. The Lord assured the two Vaikuntha inhabitants, Jaya and Vijaya, by practicing the mystic yoga system in anger, you will be cleansed of the sin of disobeying the Brahmanas and within a very short time return to me. After this speaking at the door of the Vaikuntha, the Lord returned to his abode where there are many celestial airplanes and all surpassing wealth and splendor. But those two gatekeepers, the best of the demigods, their beauty and luster diminished by the curse of the Brahmanas, became morose and fell from Vaikuntha, the abode of the Supreme Lord. It is said that when you carry sin, 
you actually become very diminished in appearance. And it is not so much a matter of diminishing in you know, becoming dark or light and so on. It is just that you would just lose your ability to basically exist. You, know, you practically carry so much sin that it is basically going to be an extraordinarily diminished experience. These two brothers, Jaya and Vijaya, the, the doorkeepers, they basically, so they basically fell from Vaikuntha. And before that, the curse had come to their head and they became very diminished in their, their appearance. Then as Jaya and Vijaya fell from the Lord's abode, a great roar of disappointment arose from the demigods, from all the demigods who were sitting in their splendid airplanes. Lord Brahma continued, those two principal doorkeepers of the personality of Godhead have now entered the womb of Diti, the powerful seaman of Kashyapa Muni, having covered them. It is said that basically there's a gap of 90 days before conception occurs. The soul which has to be conceived is already within the father 90 days prior. So then the conception occurs. So you already have all kinds of events happening in the sky the time factor in the sky compared to what happens on the planet Earth are two different things. So all of these events are transpiring at an alarming pace. And then Kashyapa Muni basically has to accept these two personalities into him. And then he is basically going to pass it on to Diti. Yeah. Um, there are circumstances which could have been basically overcome. But in this particular circumstance, it appears that it was not overcome. So in, in the normal circumstance, 90 days before conception, the soul is within the body. But this may not be true with this particular circumstance. It could probably be, you know, an instantaneous situation where they enter Kashyapa Muni and then Kashyapa Muni and Diti unite. And then she is conceiving uh, Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha, the twins. It is the prowess of the twin Asura demons that has disturbed you for it has minimized your power. There's no remedy within my power, however, for it is the Lord himself who desires to do all of this. So Lord Brahma is telling the demigods who are now fearful. Yeah. Imagine that you're so powerful and then you have a circumstance which is actually instilling fear in you. So this is required for demigods to experience, for them to surrender. Otherwise, being so powerful, there would be no motivation for surrender. There wouldn't be. But then even they are being given a chance here for them to be able to be of service and to accept circumstances that are overwhelming and accepting Krishna's plan, being a part of it, playing a role, and then life goes on. Even for them, for so powerful personalities, they are very powerful. They practically can have insurmountable experiences. What to say of us human beings? My dear sons, the Lord is the controller of the three modes of nature and is responsible for the creation preservation and dissolution of the universe. His wonderful creative power, Yoga Maya, cannot be easily understood even by the masters of yoga. That most ancient person in the personality of Godhead will alone come to our rescue. What purpose can we serve on his behalf by deliberating on the topic, on the subject? So Lord Brahma is basically saying, don't deliberate on this. He's going to come to our rescue because this is all about him interacting with his devotees. So the next chapter, victory of Hiranyaksha over all directions of the universe. I'm going to see time. It's almost seven. I have an engagement today, which in a little while. So what I'm going to do is I'll probably read for another 10 minutes and then I'll take questions. I want to conclude the session in another 20, 25 minutes. Sri Maitreya said, the demigods, the inhabitants of the higher planets were freed from all fear upon hearing the cause of the darkness explained by Brahma was born from Vishnu. Thus, they all returned to their respective planets. Most fear, most fear that is caused and most anxiety that's caused in our lives is on topics that we can't comprehend. It is a lack of knowledge which practically causes a lot of fear. Yeah, sometimes we wake up with a very bad stomach, um, you know, ache or pain in some part of the body. And then the doctor's office gives us an appointment at two o'clock and we have to wait until two o'clock to meet the doctor, but until then the pain is not going to go away. So there's an immediate research that is being done in you know, the normal circumstances 
we look at Google, you know, we search through WebMD and, you know, all these websites to find out, you know, what is the nature of pain if it were to occur in this part of the body versus that part of the body. And then you find in these websites that they would start telling you that, yes, it can be flatulence. It could be because you ate something which was not agreeing with you and you could be experiencing bloating and some gas. And they also add in the last that it could also be a very serious issue. It could be due to cancer and so on, you know, something really profoundly serious. Then the anxiety increases because one doesn't know what's happening to them. Then they go to the doctor's office at two o'clock. Uh, the doctor pushes through. He is not given any medication to mitigate the pain. He is not given anything. He is just examining the person. And then he says, this is nothing. You know, it is just the food that you ate. Then automatically the pain remains, but the suffering goes away. Suffering and pain are two different things. You see, we suffer because of lack of knowledge. So one can understand and comprehend and live with pain if they have knowledge. And as a consequence, if we have knowledge of why we are suffering, then one has the ability to process life much better. Now in this circumstance, the demigods who are suffering with all kinds of fear and anxiety, they are now departing from Lord Brahma's abode because they now have information. Once you have information, the suffering ceases, even though the pain is there, which means Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu are still on the planet. It is not resolved, but the suffering has reduced greatly. You see? So information plays such a big role in understanding why we are suffering. And why we are suffering in Krishna consciousness? We want to accept it as Krishna's arrangement. This is your arrangement. Our suffering will reduce because you learn to accept it and then you'll find that there are ways and means for you to comprehend and surrender, then our suffering will reduce. The virtuous lady, Diti, had been very apprehensive of trouble to the gods from children in her womb and her husband predicted the same. She bought four twin sons after a full 100 years of pregnancy. She held on to the pregnancy for a hundred years, not wanting these children to come out and cause problems. Such was the power of Diti. You can just imagine, such is the power of Diti, such is the power of Kashipa. They could do nothing. They were completely subject to the time factor and they were completely subject to whatever material nature wanted them to basically come in touch with so that they could facilitate a larger purpose. They could do nothing. They couldn't stop. If Titi could hold on to her pregnancy for 100 years, why couldn't she control her lust for a few minutes? Why was she demanding union with her husband at an inappropriate time when she was such a yogini that she could practically keep the children in her womb for 100 years? If she could control that particular event of pregnancy, being able to hold on to all of this within herself, this is a woman of great capacity, but she couldn't control that particular instance of inauspiciousness where she couldn't basically stop anything from happening. So it's fascinating to see that when there is the time factor that's involved, it is, so, it is supreme. That no matter how powerful you are, then you are submissive and subservient to the time factor, which is Krishna, basically. On the birth of the two demons, there were many natural disturbances, all very fearful and wonderful in the heavenly planets, the earthly planets, and in between them. There were earthquakes amongst the mountains on the earth, and it appeared that there was fire everywhere. Many inauspicious planets like Saturn appeared, along with comets, meteors, and thunderbolts. There blew winds which were most uninviting to the touch, hissing again and again, and uprooting gigantic trees. They had storms for their armies and clouds of dust for their ensigns. The luminaries in the heavens were screened by masses of clouds in which lightning sometimes flashed as though laughing. Darkness reigned everywhere, nothing could be seen. The ocean with its high waves wailed aloud as if stricken with sorrow, and there was a commotion amongst the creatures inhabiting the ocean. The rivers and the lakes were also agitated and lotuses withered. You see, these lotuses withering is all considered highly inauspicious. Misty halos appeared around the sun and the moon during the solar and lunar eclipses again and again. Claps of thunder were heard without clouds and sounds like those of rattling chariots emerged from the mountain caves. In the interior of the villages, she jackals held portentously, vomiting strong fire from their mouths 
and jackals and owls also join them with their cries. You know, when they say she jackals were vomiting fire, they were literally vomiting bile. It's a bilious expression of vomiting agni. There was excessive agni, and it is coming out. And these are all considered to be extraordinarily inauspicious. There's a whole science of omens. These are all omens. There's a whole science of omens which people used to study. It's called nimitta, nimitta shastra. Nimitta means an occurrence, yeah, an occurrence that is occurring, you know, that is coming place. To be able to study, and you know, sometimes there are nimittas when the air becomes completely still. Spirits can do that. If you have a spirit presence, you will find the air becoming completely still. still. Yeah, it will just become completely still. So this is a nimitta, this is an omen for you to understand that, okay, there's some kind of a presence that's come into the atmosphere. It will become completely still. They can do that. So the point I'm trying to make is these are all observations of um, what we would call as um, omens, which are being mentioned here, which are highly inauspicious. Raising their necks, dogs cried here and there, now in the manner of singing and now of wailing. You know, it, it's actually very, very inauspicious when you hear these dogs wailing in the night and so on. Yeah, it's just very inauspicious. O Vidura, the asses ran hither and thither in herds, striking the earth with their hard hooves and wildly braying. Um, the ass is considered inauspicious. You know, when they run in groups, they basically are considered inauspicious. This is an inauspicious omen. Frightened by the braying of the asses, birds flew shirking from their nests, which with cattle, while cattle in the cow sheds, as well as in the woods, passed dung and urine. The cows and other cattle, when they are frightened, you know, they are passing, you know, dung and urine in fear that's being seen. And this fear was palpable. It was just surrounding the whole atmosphere. Cows terrified yielded blood in place of milk. Clouds rained pus. The images of gods in the temples and shed tears and trees fell down without a blast of wind. Ominous planets such as Mars and Saturn shone brighter and surpassed the auspicious ones such as Mercury, Jupiter, and Venus, as well as a number of lunar mansions. Taking seemingly re retrograde courses, the planets came in conflict with one another, one and another. Marking these and many other omens of evil times, everyone but the four sage sons of Brahma, who were aware of the fall of Jaya and Vijaya, one of the birth as Diti's sons was seized with fear. They did not know the secrets of the potence and thought that the dissolution of the universe was at hand. These two demons who appeared in ancient times soon began to exhibit uncommon bodily features. They had steel-like frames which began to grow just like two great mountains. Their bodies became so tall that they seemed to kiss the sky with the crests of their gold crowns. They blocked the view of all directions and while walking shook the earth at every step. Their arms were adorned with brilliant bracelets and they stood as if covering the sun with their waist, which were bound with excellent and beautiful girdles. Kashyapa Prajapati, the creator of the living entities, gave his twin sons their names. The one who was born first, he named Hiranyaksha. And one who was first conceived by Diti, he named Hiranya Kashipu. So Hiranya Kashipu was the older twin. The older child, the elder child Hiranya Kashipu was unafraid of death from anyone within the three worlds because he received a benediction from Lord Brahma. He was proud and puffed up due to, his, due to this benediction and was able to bring all three planetary systems under his control. I'm going to stop here. You can read it. rest of it is pretty straightforward, but we will cover it as a part of our next session. But in all practical purposes, we have discussed chapters 16 and 17. Next week, we'll continue with 18, which is the, the duel or the fight between Hiranyaksha and Lord Varaha. In, in uh, Vishramgat in Mathura, if you visit Vrindavan, in Mathura, in Vishramgat, it is called Vishrama, which means taking rest. Lord Varaha, after his fight with Hiranyaksha, he rested on the banks of Yamuna, and that became Vishram Ghat. There's a very beautiful ancient deity of Shweta Varahadev, white Varahadev. There's also a deity of 
the regular red colored Varahadev. And then there are deities of Nasimadev on top of a hill, which is just at the bank of the Yamuna in Mathura. It's actually a wonderful, wonderful deity whom everybody, if you ever come here, you should have darshan of the deity of Varahadev. It's actually extraordinarily, extraordinarily uh, beautiful and very, very powerful. You can actually feel um, a great presence in the um, place. It is, he's, he's actually in a house on top of a hill, and then the courtyard of the house has been converted into a temple. And then families take turns. There are three families who take turns in taking care of him, but he's considered to be very ancient, and you can feel the presence. You can actually feel great, you know, great potency if you are there. I was just wanting to mention this because he rested on the banks of the Yamuna in Mathura after dueling and fighting with Hiranyaksha. So I'll stop here and I'll see if we can take questions. The broader theme of today's session was to convey the fact that when something is insurmountable, it is practically a benediction for those who are in touch with the process of Krishna consciousness. It is great suffering if you're only in touch with material nature. It's only a cause of fear if you're in touch with material nature. But for those who are in touch with Krishna consciousness, it practically portends it is a great, great benediction. This is a great benediction. So one needs to understand that this is this benediction itself is an opportunity for the devotee to practically remove clutter from their lives because now you have something which is even bigger than anything they've ever thought of. So all the other little issues they have should all be thrown to the side. They start focusing on the big one. But then how do you focus? You accept it first. It is Krishna's arrangement. Once you accept it, then intelligence is given for us to be able to navigate these circumstances. Intelligence is given from within. There will be circumstances that will be arranged. And then it also gives us the ability to increase the, the quality of a Krishna consciousness, where we are able to penetrate the modes of nature and we are able to take advantage of the opportunity that's being given to us. But it requires circumstances that are insurmountable. So one should also learn to appreciate difficult circumstances, always remembering that Krishna is involved. And even if it is just our karma, even if it is just our karma, we still accept that this is Krishna's arrangement, then it will become Krishna's arrangement. So if there are any questions, we can just take any some questions, any question at all. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you so much. It was an amazing class today, very profound. I think for me, more than anything, was very inspiring because um, uh, just that acceptance and, and the fact that you said Krishna sends somebody to sort of, and I think that's you for me, that at this point, as you go through, Krishna sends somebody to sort of give you that knowledge to surrender, you know? And I just want to personally thank you for such a wonderful, profound class. My question is, I have two questions. One is about, you mentioned about your early, where you grew up with your grandmother and uh, she, you know, she was following acharam, certain, you know. Um, so yeah. my question is more about goal and process. So where I grew up in South India, I have I grew up in an agram and there was this, what you mentioned, I felt for me when I was growing up more of a discrimination where untouchability, you couldn't touch in, you couldn't get into the house, you couldn't get into the kitchen and all of that. And that's fine. The point I'm trying to sort of, sometimes we get so involved in the process that we miss the goal. Uh, I find that when I came to ISKCON, I was so attracted because it was compassion. It was almost, I felt that um, uninspired because of the compassion. Uh, they were exalted devotees who are practicing themselves high pujari standards, but they would hug, they would talk, they would uh, give, come forward. Um, I just wanted some reflection or some understanding why so much emphasis on process uh, and that could put off people at some point, I think, even, you know, yeah. It's, it should actually be a balance. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that um, I completely agree with you that if the whole purpose of coming in touch with Vidhi or process and strict process is required so that one could be disciplined and they could purify themselves as they move forward. But in oftentimes, even in devotee communities such as ours, um, the regulative principles become the goal 
and Krishna consciousness becomes uh, what I would call, uh, you know, it kind of is, it goes to the side. So there's a greater emphasis on regulatory principles. There's a greater emphasis on rules, regulations, so on, to the point where uh, we miss the essence. So it's more form versus substance. So it requires maturity and the maturity that is, uh, comes as a part of the uh, process um, is such that the maturity itself is such that one needs to be conservative as far as they are concerned within their hearts, but they need to be extraordinarily liberal externally. So there's conservative within, so they're going to hold themselves to a high standard and a high standard is required. We should not minimize the need for high standards. So a high standard is required internally. So that's conservative internally, but then extraordinarily liberal to the outside world. This is the Vaishnava philosophy. But oftentimes, when you're constantly being imposed upon to follow rules and regulations, the rules and regulations become religion. And then what happens is one loses touch with the actual purpose, and then it all becomes very distorted. So oftentimes when you grow up in a conservative household, and yeah, my, she, she, even in my growing up years, um, until my grandmother used to finish in the evening and then retire, we couldn't touch her because she was constantly involved in the worship of the Shaligrams. She was constantly and required ba you know, bathing. What one could appreciate the discipline. The discipline was she used to wake up at three at the age of 70 used to draw water from the well and then have a bath and then come back and then start a process of worshiping her shaligrams and deities and then washing her own clothes, Not nobody should touch it, so on and so forth. So that was very, very strict. In the evening after the deity had rested, she would allow us all to come sit with her, engage with her and so on and so forth. So in one sense, what I was saying is that one could appreciate the rules, regulations and the dedication to that particular rule and regulation but one needs to know why, and one also needs to be very conservative as far as they are concerned, but very liberal with everybody else they meet. This is the Vaishnava process, which is what Mahaprabhu taught us. He practically taught us how to be strict within our own discipline, but then be very liberal in distributing prema. He was very strict. Mahaprabhu was extraordinarily strict. That should not be overlooked. He was very, very strict. And to the point where he was very strict as a sannyasi, uh, where there was any kind of, I would say, uh, misdemeanor or any kind of action which was not considered to be proper, um, he practically would want that person to take an extreme step. You know, there's a step of a sannyasi who fell down under certain circumstances who had to commit suicide. He practically went and drowned in the Ganga because, and Mahaprabhu did not feel that it was inappropriate. So that was how strict Mahaprabhu was in the sannyas ashram, but he was extraordinarily liberal in distributing prema. But then once you distribute prema, it comes into our heart, we have to follow vidhi because you can't purify your limbs and you can't purify your senses unless you follow rigorous steps of purification while softening the heart with kirtan. So it's a combination of both, um, a combination of both rules and regulations while softening the heart through Harinam with the idea of carrying the potency of distributing to others. So in my opinion, when you approach the deity, when you're engaging in deity worship and so on, we need to follow rules and regulations. We do not want to be lax, but at the same time, we want to appropriately be able to share the gift of Krishna consciousness with everybody because this is the plan of Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu is very strict but then he was extraordinarily liberal in distributing prema. So that combination requires spiritual maturity. Otherwise, what does happen is that we notice this even amongst our devotees. They get too caught up with rules and regulations. They get too caught up with you know, so many different principles that they just forget how to pass on the essence. How do you pass on the essence to others who um, need help? Yeah, they may not be following all the rules and regulations. How do you reach it to them? This is Srila Rupa Goswami's potency. How do you reach it to them? How do you reach uh, an extraordinarily sublime, pure process to someone who uh, has no knowledge? How are you going to distribute this particular process? So deity worship, you have to be strict. You can't be lax unless there's a deeper sense of maturity. But even then, externally, you have to be strict. Um, Jananivas Prabhu, Pankajangri Prabhu, 
externally very strict. They may have a very close relationship with the deities, but then you follow procedure. Within procedure, you have this extraordinary exchange of intimacy with the deity, which is what our Goswami is taught as well. So um, a combination. The Goswamis are a prime example. Very strict with themselves, very liberal with the outside world. They used to inquire of villagers. They used to inquire of people locally about their lives. They used to solve problems for people who had issues. And they used to pay, spend their time you know, with them as if it was important. You know, this was basically, you know, it was not so much that, oh, it's not very important. Your suffering, it doesn't matter to me. They used to account for the suffering and they used to be compassionate. So compassion was primary. Mercy was primary. But then they were also very strict with rules. There was this particular instance where there was a big scholar who challenged Srila Rupa Goswami. And as he came down, Srila Rupa Goswami told him in Vrindavan, that yes, I accept you as my superior. You could wear it on your shoulders that you defeated me. And then as he went further away from Vrindavan, he met Srila Jiva Goswami Pad. Jiva Goswami Pad could not accept this particular insult to his spiritual master. Rupa Goswami was Srila Jiva Goswami's spiritual master. He practically challenged the scholar and he practically brought him to ground, defeated him in scholarship. This news was came to Srila Rupa Goswami. Srila Rupa Goswami banned Jiva Goswami from entering Vrindavan. Srila Jiva Goswami spent actually many, many days sleeping in a crocodile nest, which was abandoned by crocodiles. You know, the crocodiles lay eggs in the bank of River Yamuna, and then the eggs are hatching. He actually spent time in such a place for many, many days because in, in, in deep sorrow, because he was banned from entering Vrindavan by Srila Rupa Goswami. What was the reason? He was banned because he didn't follow the rule of humility, which Mahaprabhu held as supreme. Now, this would seem to be an extraordinarily strict um, reproach. But that was how the Goswamis were. They were very strict amongst themselves, but they were very liberal to outsiders. Then Sanatan Goswami, he reminded Srila Rupa Goswami that, yes, Humility is of great importance, but then even greater than humility, it is compassion of Mahaprabhu, which holds even greater importance. So the point I'm trying to make here is that you will find that you need to be very strict with yourself, uncompromisingly, but you need to be able to give liberally to others. Only those who are very strict with themselves have the ability to give value to others and something of substance to others. The risk that we face is when we throw the baby out with the bathwater, where we throw all the regulations out because they're not important, or we just hold on to the regulations as religion. Both of these are risks, and this requires spiritual maturity to balance out. But yes, I can understand what you're trying to say. Thank you, Prabhu. I really appreciate today's class. I felt it deeply touched, and, and I sure. thank you for today's class. Sure, absolutely. Um, Haribo, I, I think someone, Krishna, you, you call yourself, uh, I think this is Victor? And... Yes. <laughs> okay, Victor. Yeah, go on, please. Hi. Um, so the question that I have is, the Maha Mantra originates from the spiritual sky, and I was just wondering, as we chant, are we connecting more directly to the spiritual sky, or are we bringing more of the spiritual energies into the world? And what's the difference between chanting within ourselves versus chanting externally into the atmosphere around us or into the world? When we call upon the Maha Mantra, we are practically bringing Krishna into the atmosphere. So, Golo Kela Premadan Harinam Sankirtan. The Maha Mantra is descending from Goloka. It's completely non different from Krishna. And then it is dancing on a purified tongue. The tongue is being purified, becoming in touch with prasadam. And then the Maha Mantra basically dances on such a purified tongue. Yeah. Golo Kela Premadan Harinam Sankirtan. So, when we call upon Krishna, whether internally or externally, we are practically drawing him into the atmosphere because Krishna's names and he are non-different. Nama, Naminoho, Abhinnatvam. The Swarup Shakti, the entire Rupa of Krishna is contained within the name. For one who is purified and for one who is basically um, kind of um, what we would call as reached the point of being able to have spiritual vision 
each and every time they utter the name of Krishna and Radharani, Hare, then they're able to see Sri Sri Radha Sham Sundar. They're able to see Sri Sri Radha Damodar. They're able to see the divine couple each and every time they're chanting Hari Nam. Yeah. So we are inviting Krishna into the atmosphere. So it's not the spiritual sky. It is practically Krishna himself who comes into the atmosphere. And along with him, everything else also comes. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Anybody else? Not sure if there's a chat item or anything, but yeah. All right, so I think I'm gonna, st yeah. Yes, if there, anybody has a question, you may ask, I can I do have a, a few minutes to go. All right. So I think I'll, we'll end with this. And thank you very much for participating. Um, I have many options. I can stop the class at 5.30 p.m. India, which is 12 noon in the UK. I can start at 6, which is 12.30. Or I can start at 6.30, which is 1 o'clock. All of these work for me. Um, if, if there is a predominant number of people who want to join at six o'clock, which is 12.30 in the UK, correspondingly, whatever it is in America, then I think we'll stick with this. But I was just wanting to say, I'm flexible 30 minutes here and there. Yes, uh, please ask the question. There's can someone you hear here. Me, yeah, yes, can I can. Me? Yeah. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you. I heard your name from uh, Bhakti Ratnata Prabhu and uh, we, and from Eastern Central Jersey and uh, Priya Mataji. And, sure. and thank you for giving them me the link so that I can listen to you and get a lot of wisdom from you. My quick question is uh, Prabhu, Amedanath Prabhu, I, I was listening last night to him in one of his interview. He said that Radha Rani used to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Mahamantra also. And Chaitan Mahaprabhu also used to chant the same man. So that's why it's so powerful to chant the same. So the Hare means Radha in the Mahamantra, right Prabhu? So when yes. Radha Rani used to chant her own name, Hare Krishna or? Mahaprabhu used to chant as, 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 uh, as Srimati Radha Rani is in the mood of Srimati Radha Rani. Yeah. So it is like this. Yeah. When you are in Raja, when you are in Raja and you're related to Krishna with a specific relationship, you are going to call out Krishna, keeping the relationship in mind. So for example, Mother Yashoda would call Krishna in that particular relationship. Now, when Radharani's mood is being embraced by Mahaprabhu Krishna, who is descending, then he comes as a devotee, and at that point in time, he is practically showing us how one could come in touch with his beloved. So this time, Srimati Radharani as Mahaprabhu, which is Radharani's mood, is chanting Hare Krishna. The potency that Mahaprabhu is giving us is the potency of Srimati Radharani, whose understanding, surrender, and love for Krishna is unsurpassed. It's unmeasurable. Krishna is unlimited. Her love for him is unlimited. When Krishna himself is descending as Mahaprabhu and he's carrying her mood, he is practically coming with that particular understanding of seva, that particular understanding of that connection, and he's distributing it. In that sense, when Mahaprabhu is chanting, it is Srimati Radharani who is chanting. Through the sound vibration, you practically are able to gain an understanding, or rather you're coming in touch with the highest expression of love and surrender that anybody can possess in Krishna's relationship. So that's the uh, the understanding of the Shastra and of Charitamrita. And the word Rama Prabhu, is it Sri Ram Chandra or Balram? It is basically Radhika Raman. 
the entire Hare Krishna Mahamantra to explain this. Srimati Radharani and Krishna, the divine couple, they are the origin of every other avatar. He is the avatari. So, Shri Shri Sita Ram, their origin is Shri Shri Radha Krishna. Yes, Lakshmi Narasimha, their origin is Shri Shri Radha Krishna. Yeah. Lakshmi Narayan, the origin is Radha and Krishna. So in that sense, when we are chanting the Mahamantra, Hare refers to Srimati Radha Rani, Krishna obviously refers to Krishna. Rama here is Radhika Raman, the beloved of Radha Rani. So for those of us who are chanting in the line of Mahaprabhu, we are chanting the names of Krishna as Krishna, and we are also chanting his names as Radhika Raman. So that is the Rama the reservoir of all pleasure in the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. This Hare Krishna Mahamantra, on the other hand, because it represents the divine couple, Shri Shri Radha and Krishna, can also reveal Lord Ramachandra and Mother Sita, can reveal Shri Shri Lakshmi Narasimha, can reveal the different Vishnu avatars. All of them are manifest from Shri Shri Radha and Krishna. And as a consequence, everybody can be realized through the Mahamantra as well. But the Rama in the Mahamantra for the Vrajavasi and for the, those who are initiated in the disciplic succession of Mahaprabhu. For us, Rama in this is Radhika Raman. Thank you, Prabhu. Radhika Raman, so if you ask, what's the synonymous of Radhika Raman, Dad, if you say? Sorry? What was your question? I'm sorry. What's the synonymous or other name of Radhika Raman? Um, Ra Radhika Raman is. Means, no, I, 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 I'm not able to comprehend your question. I'm no, sorry. Like, if you say Radhika Raman, I'm not able to understand the complete meaning of yeah, Radhika. So it is basically one who is the reservoir of pleasure, the source of all pleasures for Srimati Radha Rani. Got it. Yeah. yeah. That is sure. basically the. The, right, the meaning. Right, right. So the idea which we have to understand and we have to embrace, and this requires realization, this requires the practice of the Mahamantra. The idea we want to embrace is the Mahamantra is the origin of every other avatar. So Narasimha Dev and Lakshmi Devi can come from the Mahamantra because their origin is Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. Lord Sri Sri Ram Lakshman, sorry, Sri Sri Ram, Sita Ram can come from the Mahamantra because their origin is Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. So there can be realizations that can come for devotees of different expansions of Krishna while they chant the Mahamantra. But in reality, we are glorifying Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. This, is, this requires practice. This requires um, uh, you know, an understanding as well. Yeah. Um, so I just joined first time and love to listen to you more and more. What when I can start listening to your classes, Prabhu? Um, actually, uh, I give this class every Saturday, but I also have a SoundCloud channel. I also have a YouTube channel. Um, you, you can basically go to my website. It's sandini, S-A-N-D-H-I-N-I.com. Sandini, S-A-N-D-H-I-N-I.com. And you could find references to my YouTube channel and my SoundCloud channel there. Or you could ask Bhakti Ratnakar Prabhu for um, a link to my SoundCloud, or you could you could kind of write to me, and I will add you to this group, and then you will receive the links as well. Sure, Prabhu, and I will write to you from Bhakti Ratnakar Prabhu. Thanks, Prabhu. Yeah, please do. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Um, someone is asking if the recording for the uh, the UK class that you gave two weeks back can be uploaded. I, I, it's already been uploaded. I think if you check the, if you're a part of the Srimad Bhagavatam group, um, if you could just scroll up, you will find the two classes are uploaded. I think the previous week's session and the UK class, both together. All right. If there isn't, if there isn't anything else, we will stop here. Thank you. And we will see you next week. And we will continue our discussion of the third canto. And it's very exciting. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you.